he proposed to her at graduation and my head nearly exploded. I said, you may love her, but I'm 97.9% .9 sure that when you get her back to DC, she's not going to make sense in the world that you're trying to build for yourself. As promised, we have a winner of the free Amazon gift card because there was someone who left a rating and review. And we're going to talk about that. And she won her gift card. She says, I love this podcast. I love the topics and the host is well experienced and intelligent. He also Im invited some awesome, intelligent guests on the interviews. This is Black Excellence. I hope to see the podcast grow and go far. That is from K Bianca 817. So thank you, K Bianca, for leaving that review. And I hope you are enjoying your free Amazon gift card. Just one of the benefits of leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Today's guest is a mother, a senior communications professional with more than 20 years of experience and cross-sector interdisciplinary experience. She firmly believes the best path to success begins with the goal based in mind, strategic integrated communications plan. She's also a reporter for NBC News, Brave Arts Community. Let's show some love to Allison Finch Wilson. How are you doing this evening, Allison? Hey, Sean, I'm doing well. I want to talk to you about, because there's there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about, but for the sake of time, I'll try to narrow it down in reference to your first marriage. And what were some of the things that you wish you knew before getting married? That is a great question. Um, I think, so let me preface it by saying I eloped after two and a half months. And so I think there was so much you know, you don't even know what you don't know when you do something like that. So um, luckily it turned out really well, right? It was an 18 year marriage. So no complaints in the department of like, um, you know, did you pick the wrong, you know, person? Because there is so much that you just can't, you, you can't even begin to know. So for example, I remember um, getting back from where we eloped in New Orleans and having this moment where I got completely terrified and was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is the kind of man who enjoys waking up on Saturday mornings and doing yard work. I don't know if he wakes up at 2 a.m. to go do things on the internet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's on the down low. Like there's just so many things that you can't you can't even know that you don't know. So when I get asked that question, and, and I've often gotten asked that question from other uh, women in my family who are considering eloping. And I'm, I'm, I'm the type of person who never says, don't do this or don't do that. I always say, here's some things you might want to think about. Here's some things that I wish I had thought about or that I wish I had known to ask or you know those sorts of things. So I think uh, just in terms of thinking through Mm -hmm. um, partnership because, you know, our marriages are the most important partnership of our adult lifetime, right? So we want to take them very seriously. And at that time, uh, and of course, throughout the marriage, it was taken very seriously. So you, um, you just want to make sure that you're in that right headspace, mm -hmm. uh, when you're thinking through a partner and understanding, um, uh, what you want your goals for your partnership to be, because I think we were talking about this on um, on Twitter, uh, coming from a, a single parent home. No one wants to stay married more than kids from single parent homes, right? Because we grew up with one parent in the home. So, um, so yeah, it's it's an important thing with you know lots of questions that another kid coming home right now. Uh, lots of questions that I think are are worth um, considering. I hope that was an okay answer. Yes, no, for sure. There, there's no wrong answer. I mean, from your experience to everything that you know, I mean, there's no wrong answer. And I asked you that question because I think, especially in today's social media age, with all the information we have, we still don't ask the right questions. So yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point. And I think, you know, a lot of times we don't always know what to ask. Especially, you know, like we were talking about, if you if you do come from a single parent home, you know, you 
you don't always know, um, you don't, if you're not seeing a healthy example, particularly of a relationship, it can take you longer to figure out what you should be asking and what you should be looking for. And then when you add on to that, like, um, you know, coming from a single parent home, when you're dealing with childhood um, issues, childhood abandonment issues, even, you know, you are approaching relationships from a wounded place a lot of times, which is why I'm such a big proponent of centering self and centering healing prior to looking for um, a spouse, you know, or looking for that perfect partnership. Because, you know, we all say we want the best, you know, we want to attract the best, but really we attract what we vibrate, right? So if we're working to be the best version of ourselves, that's really when we're going to attract someone who's vibrating at that same level. But when we are working to attract someone from a wounded place, even if we're not aware that we are operating from that wounded place, you know, as my mom always said, like attracts like. So that's kind of what we're going to draw in energetically. Mm -hmm. I agree because I tell people and, and I kind of say it in a joking way, but I like really mean it that I back when I was single, contrary to popular belief, I tell people once upon a time I was single <laughs> um, <laughs> that I chose people based on my confidence level. Mm. So, and, and again, there's no shade to, to any of my exes or anything, right. like that, but, yeah. when, but when I look back, I'm thinking, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I see where, what happened there, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. But those are like lessons that we need, right? Because everybody plays a role in our soul growth, you know, yes. whether it's someone that we're going to walk with for a chapter or, you know, a season or a lifetime, you know, we have these different soul ties, you know, that help us refine ourselves as we go. And, you know, I'll tell you, like, I, when I was in college, um, so everybody that, you know, I've had the opportunity to interact with at a partnership level has taught me something about myself. And I'm grateful for those lessons. Yes. And I remember this, uh, this guy in college, um, you know, one of the first questions he asked me was, well, what are your goals for yourself? And where do you see yourself being, you know, in 10 years? And I was, you know, maybe 20 years old. And it was actually the first time that I thought about partnership in connection with co-creation and legacy building. And this guy had like very definite, you know, goals for himself and, you know, was always telling me, I see us doing this. I see us doing that. Now, you know, I, this is going to be a really crazy story. So, um, but I'll try to make it, I'll try to give you like the short version of it. So like eight months in and I bought into his vision, you know, he had goals to be like a, a you know, a very powerful executive or to, to own a bank even, you know, um, big goals and knew how to work it. He was great at networking. He saw me as like an integral piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would pick events to go to, you know, to, you know, talk to this person and talk to that person. And he resonated with me. It wasn't just like strategic partnership. It was like, wow, I really vibe with this guy. I like him. So eight months in, he all of a sudden said, I need to talk to you. And he said, um, you know, I've been doing some thinking and you're not the person that I thought you were. I don't think you're good enough to be with me. And I was like, I mean, coming from the, like, I'm 20, you know, so I bought into this vision and I was like, what do you mean? I am good enough. I'm stuck to you, right? And he broke it off with me, like right then, <laughs> sending me into, it's funny now, it wasn't funny then, Sean, but know, right? sending me into this like spiraling depression for like a couple weeks even to the point where like his mother had to come to the where I was staying, you know, and I was, I was a, um, like a senior at UNC Charlotte had to come and like get me out of the bed and take me to go eat. The bright side of this was my cousin was getting married and I hadn't eaten in so long. I'd lost a bunch of weight and looked fabulous in the dress. But come to find out he had cheated on me and gotten the girl he was cheating with pregnant and was so terrified, he didn't know what else to do. So he just like broke up with me in that way. And I think it just also goes to show that like, People aren't necessarily trying to go around hurting people. 
you know, if we're operating from a wounded place, you know, sometimes we do things that, you know, we just, I don't know, you're frightened, you're terrified in that moment. You don't know what else to do uh, because a couple years later, you know, I was a working professional. I was at a, uh, a TV station in Savannah, Georgia. He called me out of the blue to apologize. And I mean, it was just about clearing his karma because he had met this woman that he like was so in love with and wanted to marry and wanted, he was just like, I want you to know it was never you. It was always me. And this is what I, you know, why I did this. And I was really proud of him because it showed how he even grew, you know, through that experience and was preparing himself for his union, you know? So, um, you know, just an example of how, like, we're always on this path of growth and of figuring out like, you know, who not only who we want to partner with at that time, you know, and hopefully, particularly when it's marriage, it's for the long haul, right? We all want that. Mm -hmm. Um, But also just how each relationship is a stepping stone to like soul refinement for for both parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so much I want to ask you in this. There's so many questions that just kind of, I heard everything you said, but I was like, good. Yeah. (laughs) One. uh, Okay. There's two things. Mm -hmm. First, when I went through my divorce with my ex-wife, uh, I, I spoke with her about the things that I'd done wrong. Cause I was asking, I was like, what did I do wrong? You know, and she, she gave me her scroll. She gave me a whole laundry list of things I done wrong, you know, and, and there was no infidelity or anything, but yeah. it just helped me to realize like, Oh, okay. Yeah. These are some areas that I need to tighten up in my life. I was like, okay, just kind of from a re- reflective place. Uh, so when I got married this time around, I was like, you know what? I'll make sure I need to fix these things because I'm not trying to mess this up again. Cause you know, the divorce rate numbers yeah. go higher the the more times you, you get married, right? Right, right. So I think it's 67% the second time around divorce rates. Uh and then the second question I want well not the question, but yeah, the question I want to ask you was how do you feel about should a person know their purpose before they get married? And because when you talked about him asking you about being an integral part of the relationship, I was thinking, I was like, do you really need to know your purpose before you get married? So that way you you're picking from purpose opposed to just looks. That's a great question. I, just I think it's different. That. No, it's a great question. And I think it's different for everybody. You know, I think and there's and the, the great thing about it is uh, personally I don't think that there there are mistakes there are only lessons you know so we're all impacted by our upbringing by our environment by the pressures that are put upon us by family by community maybe by church you know a religious organization perhaps you know so there there aren't any wrong answers because we're growing and learning through every experience. And I think particularly when it comes to ending a marriage, you know, no one is going to understand how painful that is, except for the two people going through it. Right. And you, you have to know for yourself when it's time to walk away. And, And I'm not telling anybody to walk away from their marriage. If you still have passion for that person, if you still want that person, you work on it, you know, like you'll know, you know, when your soul no longer feels at rest. When you know that like, whoa, there's some things here. There's both of us. Like you pointed out, you did yourself reflecting. You saw where you went wrong. You know, like clearly I did the same thing. My ex did the same thing. When there's love there, you do that for one another. You want to understand where you went wrong. So I think that like if you choose, you know, to to get married, let's just say you choose to get married younger when you're a little less mature. You know, the person who you partner with at that time has important lessons to teach you and you can grow together with someone or you can grow apart, you know, with someone. It just depends. Now, everyone would hope that you grow together, that you have those shared goals and that shared vision, uh, whatever that looks like for you. You know, like if your goal is co-creation and legacy building. Hopefully, like it would be great if when we're all 22, 23 years old, we find the person that's in lockstep with that plan, right? And it works. We may not, you know, sometimes we are blinded by lust, you know, a lot of times and we are not thinking, you know, look at how many quickie uh, weddings happen in Vegas, right? And then when we look at our grandparents, I mean, honestly, Sean, we're really lucky when you think about it. 
a friend of mine posted something the other day that was like, it's not 1940. Nobody has to stay with cranky Leroy for the next 65 years. You know, we're lucky in that back in the day, people really had to stay married for economic stability. You know, so if you were with somebody who just drove you, drove your spirit mad, you were in it, right? So, and when you think about that, you then think about the impact on the kids. And I remember something you posted on Twitter once where you said, taking the, fa taking the um, father out of the home is the most detrimental thing. And I'll be honest, I didn't completely agree with you because Allison, I feel they like- came for me. People <laughs> came for me. I, they came for me, Allison. I got, I they came for me. Because I, I hadn't met you yet. And you know, like when you don't haven't met people, you don't know how they're going to interpret what you say. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to give that a pass. But you know, when kids are experiencing things in the home, and I'm not even saying it's anybody's fault, right? Let's just say two people aren't getting along. And that's creating an environment that's not healthy for the kids. You know, we then we're being called to break generational curses at that point, right? And, you know, then you got to do that talking to say, hey, we can't be together, but we still have to show up for these kids, you know, but then we're talking about like, let's each like assess where we are, get our stuff together. We, it, we may not be the best fit for one another, but let's commit to positive co-parenting for these kids, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that is so good. Yeah, because, and I can stay on this topic forever. I, <laughs> Me too. I, let's yeah. chop it up. Okay. Okay. For sure. Because when you talked about being younger and a lot of times when you are younger, you are like blinded by lust. Right. Yeah. But do you think most younger people like don't know their calling? I mean, as far as like, say if you were going to be an athlete, right. And you've been playing but I'm just using that as an example. You've been playing football since you were 10, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're saying you're 20. Because I, I married when I was 24. I thought I thought I was going to be like a, a co-pastor. I thought I was going to be a like elder kind of thing. So I, I thought I knew where I was going. So I, I chose yeah. based on this is what I'm looking for in a wife. Yeah. And 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 it ended, right? And now it's like, I no longer desire to be a, a pastor or elder, but I just knew that God always wanted me to have a microphone in my hand. And that's not saying that I had to be to thousands and thousands of people, right? But that vision, but it died, you know? Wow. So, yeah. so I wonder how many people actually marry just kind of based on lust or just based on like where they are in life. Cause I think sometimes we can choose somebody that, an example for me, I got a vision. My vision was like born again, but just in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I chose, I was like, okay, this woman is vital to your the, mission. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you know, I, yeah. go ahead. What? No, I was just going to say that. I, I think that's why we just can't be hard on ourselves. You know, I mean, it's an experience for us. It's, a, it, it's an experience for the partner as well. You know, like we're growing together in these partnerships, whether they last or not. But you may like to your point about, you know, I, I do think that young people need to slow down on getting married, particularly because we are not econ as economically fragile, especially women. Right. As we were in 1960. We don't have to get married to ensure we have a roof over our heads. Yeah. So there's really no reason to rush it. We should take the time to figure out what it is that we that really resonates with our soul. Um, and here I'm going to tell you a, good, a great example, two, two really quick examples. So the guy I told you about who told me I was no good, you know, I wanted to you could not tell me I didn't want to marry this man, even though, Sean, I had sacrificed my vision. Right. Like. I knew that I wanted to be, I always knew that from the time I was 15, that I wanted to be a television news reporter and anchor. And when I met this man and bought into his vision, because I'm like, oh yes, co-creation, legacy building. And he's like, well, my path is going to take me here, here, here. And by this time I'll be a vice president at this bank and this and this. And I'm like, well, I guess 
Like if I was going to be a TV news reporter, that would take me all around the country, but I don't have to do that. I can just pivot to public relations and then that'll keep me wherever you are. You know, so here I am like ready to sell my vision down the river, you know, for this man. And I was telling my mom, oh my, don't get me started. My mom did not, did not want to hear about men. Like she was like, I don't want to hear about them. They're not going to last. She was very, you know, she kept it real. I'll be honest. And in hindsight, absolutely right. I'm going to tell my daughter the same thing. Back then it felt cool. But I'm like, no, mom, I want to marry him. Send me my birth certificate. Because I was like, we're going to sneak off and get married. Thank God I didn't, right? Yeah. So that's one example. The second is this. And I'm, I really want to share this for your viewers. Mm -hmm. My little brother uh, went to... Wilberforce University in Ohio for college, for undergrad, and then came back to DC to do American University for law school. He met this girl from the country, from the cornfields of Ohio I'm and was there. in, okay, so he met this girl, but she had never, she was from the cornfields of Ohio and had never left. Lovely girl, right? I told him, I said, you may love her. He proposed to her at graduation and my head nearly exploded. I said, you may love her, but I'm 97.9% .9 sure that when you get her back to DC, she's not going to make sense in the world that you're trying to build for yourself. Oh no, you can't, I love her, blah, blah, blah. So he moved the girl back to DC she got into grad school at American University. And sure enough, within eight months, he was leaving this girl at their apartment so he could go hang out with his new law school friends who were much more intellectually stimulating to him than this girl. Now, okay, he didn't listen, great. Luckily, he didn't marry her. Was it a mistake? No, because guess what? She got her master's from American University and she otherwise wouldn't have. You know, so everything happens for a reason. Everything's in divine order. Everything's in divine timing. And I think that's just the way we have to look at it. We can tell people like our, like, here's what I think. And here's what I think you may want to think about. Um, and he did later tell me, you know, you were, yeah, yeah, you know, I started hanging out with other people. And he recognized that subconsciously, initially, he was sabotaging the relationship because it didn't make sense. So, you know, even when we do start, imploding subconsciously imploding our relationships it's those things when people no longer start to resonate with our soul we're not even aware sometimes of like the passive aggressive stuff that we begin to do to sabotage the relationship it just happens and that's a lot of the stuff that you i think you think about when you're in reflection about where you went wrong you know some of the stuff that like that i did to end my marriage I didn't even really think about until we were like split up. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that's why I did that. Okay. So that's why at night I would stick my earbuds in my ear every night and listen to an audible book rather than engage in conversation. You know what I mean? So you start to think about those things. I think after that. sorry, I'm all over the place. <laughs> no, this is, this is good because, and this is like, <laughs> this is totally unscripted. Um, I know. They're totally unscripted because I, you know, I had not planned on going to another area. So do you think, do you think purpose or vision can split a marriage? Like, Ooh. you know what I'm saying? Because as I hear you talk and, and even from your brother's example, and like say, thank God he didn't marry her. But can that even cause division and divorce in a marriage? Because say if you are... Yeah. 28 you get married right and then say by the time you're 35 you're like i want to do this and now it's causing strife in the marriage because maybe yeah. the other spouse was like we're good but right. now the other person want to go out on a limb and start a business and you know what i'm saying so i wonder if that can cause division and, and divorce in the marriage as far as just like being maybe even being a late bloomer in life, you know, maybe you call I, later. I absolutely think so. I mean, I think you have to be equally yoked, you yes. know, at least at first, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, cause you're not going to do it. I, I mean, uh, when I, I was dating a guy 
um, who was an atheist. Well, he wasn't really an atheist. Was he an atheist or was he agnostic? I don't remember. Either way, he was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. You know, he was, it wasn't just that he was fun. He was kind, you know? And so I had had a history of narcissistic guys. So finally, here's this kind person. You know, mm -hmm. he was kind and he was creative. And he, he wasn't, when I, you know, a lot of times when people hear atheists, they're like, ooh. No, he just believed that you should be good because you should be good. You sh you didn't have to ascribe it to a higher power. He was probably the most like Adamic figure you could like meet. He just didn't ascribe it to a higher power. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day asking him, well, if we were to get married and have kids, what would we tell them? And he was like, well, we would tell them mommy believes this and daddy believes this. And I'm like, that's not okay with me. You know, I mean, I'm not super religious. I never have been. I've always been, uh, I was raised a uh, non-denominational Christian with a very spiritual lens, you know, um, not in any sort of um, restrictive uh, kind of kind of church or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But still, my, my, um, my connection with God is extraordinarily important to me enough to where I'm like, I can't marry someone who's going to tell our kids they don't believe in God, you know, as, or who, who wouldn't agree to attend a, a spiritual community with me. You know, I still seek those connections, right? I want to belong to a church. You know, I don't, I'm going to be honest. I don't want to be in church every Sunday or Saturday. And I have, there was a seventh day Adventist I dated for a few months and he yeah. wanted me in church every day, all day. And I'm like, that's not okay with me. Cause for me, talking to God is like, meditating on the beach or walking through the woods, you know, aligning myself with my highest vibration and listening to divine guidance within. I still want to go to church, you know, just not all the time. So that's kind of kind of how I am. But I can't, you know, uh, be with someone who just rejects a, a spiritual community altogether, because I think that's an important part of life and an important part of raising children. Um, you know, because they have to see, they have to practice giving back to others. They have to be around people like that, in my opinion, right? So yes, you want to find someone you could be equally yoked with, and hopefully they do grow with you. Um, but if they don't, you know, that's, that's the tragic and beautiful part of, you know, progressing through different soul ties, I think. You know, I mean, if your first marriage hadn't ended, how would you have found the gorgeous and lovely current Mrs. Heineman? Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Who's right for you right now? Yes. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. uh, that's just kind of how I look at it. Mm. That is so good. So a lot of times you're looking at basically life as lessons. Yeah, that's all. I think that's all we are. We are we are honing and refining our souls, I think. Mm. So that, and I, you know, I don't know um, what religious denomination you are, but I believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, we're sent back here if we don't get it right. Yeah. So we are honing and refining our souls. So hopefully we don't have to come back here. <laughs> we are all walking each other home. If mm -hmm. we can get close to spirit, if we can align our souls and really uh, be like Christ. We don't have to come back here no more. Mm. That's what I believe. Like this is the, that's our that's how we get to heaven by doing the work on ourselves. And a lot of times, the hardest lessons come through our soulmates. Mm. That's you know, good. that's good. So, how do you feel about? Because as I hear you talk, how do you feel about like staying uh, on the same accord with your spouse or your significant other? Because I think a lot of times marriages end because someone is growing mm. and someone is kind of neutral. Uh, John Maxwell, I was reading one of his books. He said, every day you're either preparing or repairing. That's profound. Yeah. Right. <laughs> every day. And I was just thinking one of the reasons I went through my divorce and after 15 years was because we didn't stay in tune with where we were in life we were just living yes yes i i would agree with that okay. you know same sort of situation mm -hmm. um and that that those are excellent i think you know 
you have to like each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I used to always tell my spouse, former spouse, relationships die by inches. You know, there's never one big thing that just ends a relationship because there's too much love there. So you forgive and you forgive and, for, and you forgive, but it chips away at something every time. And then that's when we start doing the subconscious kind of like microaggressions. Like, well, I'm not really giving to this because of this. I mean, you don't really recognize it at the time. You just disengage, you know, and then someone is like, oh, well, you're ignoring me. And well, I'm not, a, okay, maybe I, am. I don't know. You know, you're just, you're, you're dealing with your own flux of emotions. So I think you have to stay engaged in that communication if it matters to you, you know, recognizing that it matters to you, recognizing that it's going to die by inches if you, if it doesn't matter to you, you know? Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, when something is not resonating with your soul, you know, the divine is going to remove something that needs to be removed, especially if you're on a path and that person isn't on your path with you. I'm not wishing that on anybody. <laughs> you know, like I want everybody's relationship to work, you know, um, but I think, you know, again, we're all dealing with so many different kinds of traumas and issues. Sometimes we don't always know how to engage in the most healthy way. You know, so we are not always thinking about, oh, OK, this is a moment where I have a choice that could either chip another layer off of our foundation or fortify it. You know, we're not always thinking about that. And mm -hmm. then if our if our partner, here's the other thing I think is important. If our partner is exploring something and we really love them, you know, we want to explore it with them. I think that's so important. Um I want to understand what my partner is excited about and into, um, you know, as long as it's not like, you know, something, something that's really crazy, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's not, let's, I want to explore Satanism. What? No, we're not, you know what I mean? Yeah, but if yeah. all of a sudden you tell me, you know, let's say I'm going to give like this, the, a small, I, don't, I can't even think of a small example. Let's say you are all of a sudden like, you know, I want to better understand the teachings of Buddha. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that doesn't threaten my sense of being a Christian. You know, pe there are people all over the world who uh, who worship different deities, right? So yeah, I want to explore that with you. I want to understand where your head is and what you're thinking about. I think we have to do that if we want to stay uh, engaged and to understand where our significant other is going particularly for co-creation mm -hmm. if we want to co-create something beautiful with someone i mean you know I, we're all looking not all but a lot of us are looking for the tony robbins to our sage the jay-z to our beyonce the bill gates to our melinda you know not necessarily at that scale mm -hmm. but we want someone that we are like, okay, well, what are we doing here? Like, I love you to pieces. How are we creating this legacy? Something that our great grandchildren are going to look back at and say, this is what they did. You know, like, I think, I think if that is our goal, um, or if that's what we want to create with someone to have that, that beautiful structure, we owe it to ourselves and to them to stay aligned mm. or to work on that alignment. Mm -hmm. because yeah because there's two things that I, I yeah the first one is I learning from my divorce I was like I have to learn how to look at my wife with um uh, through the lens of healthy eyes and what I mean by that is when she gets when we have disagreements and we fall out it's easy for to cover that glass with, with some kind of stain where I don't see her the same, you know? So it's like, I don't ever, cause one thing I did with my ex-wife was I didn't see her the same that I did before. Mm. So the respect level was out there. So I, I, now this time around, I'm like, I don't want the view through which I see my wife as stained. So whenever we fall out and have disagreements, instead of me always harping on what she's doing wrong, I have to remind myself of all her great qualities. Mm. 
and it keeps me it keeps me in love with her because it's easy right oh she didn't do this she didn't like it's easy to do that so i'm training myself to always think of her great qualities when we fall out because it's easy to fall out and next thing you know you're not talking for a couple of days like it's easy right. but to actually think different and then the other thing was and this is this isn't popular but i'm learning this over time that i'm taking away my expectations of my wife say it again <laughs> i'm taking away the expectation from my wife now and the reason i say that allison is because I realize with expectation can become disappointment because if you aren't having those constant conversations about the things that you expect. So even when my wife make dinner for me or whatever, I always thank her. I'm always trying to have an attitude of gratitude because she didn't have to do it. Right. Like she doesn't right. owe me anything. She's still her individual person. Right. So just having an attitude of gratitude, it just kind of helps me to choose her every day. Yes. Intentional. So that's something I'm learning to take away those expectations that I remember one time we were so busy and she's like, babe, I'm sorry. I didn't make your dinner for, I'm sorry. I forgot. And I was like, you know what? It's all good. It's okay. Because I'm learning to not have that expectation that if she have an off day or she's sick or something, like, is she really supposed to have my dinner ready for me if she's sick? So. Gratitude opens yeah. people up to to receiving more love and abundance. I mean, just even, you know, counting the things that you're grateful for and the fact that you are just being extra grateful, you know, and we won't even call it extra, right? Just being open to pushing gratitude towards your wife in those situations is going to take your marriage so far, which you already know. It's such a good practice. Mm, yeah yes. and it's helping but i have to learn how to renew my mind keep my mind renewed unlearn and and learn again you know learn some yeah. things um and always be a student because my wife she's 12 years younger than me huh? but she, like she teach me so much stuff you know so it's like i'm always I saw you say that she, yeah you say she hips you to game i love that <laughs> she put me on allison there's so much stuff just what to look out for she like uh, i wouldn't do that or you got to be careful with that person just all kind of little stuff she's like no mm -hmm. she no nah, she a little too nice to you not you know just little stuff and i'll be like no she cool and like, mm. but that's what partnership is right exactly. you know like where one is weak the other is strong Yes. You know, you're you're going to have your partner's back, Yes. you know, um, because you are doing that co-creating and that ensuring like, OK, I know you have your eyes fixed here. So I'm your eyes over here. Mm. I mean, that's I think what good partnership is. Yes. Marry somebody who can see your blind spots, I would always say. Absolutely. <laughs> we just got all off track. I know. <laughs> it's I know. 45 minutes, but it's OK. We We kicking it abandonment i want to talk about that because when we talk about childhood issues and you kind of addressed it earlier in the show but why is it that we have to deal with abandonment if we are aware of some of our traumas like what does abandonment cause like what are some of the effects of abandonment so i i'm of the opinion that it impacts everything um, and, and, and we're always working on it. You know, we, we are called to continually work on it. Even when we think we fixed it, there's still things that can come along and trigger it. Um, you know, my dad, I think I told you this, my dad left when I was two, um, which, and, and then like ignore, pretty much ignored me and my brother for a really long time. Um, and it impacted me in ways I'm still fully figuring out. But in relation to marriage, I knew, especially after dealing with a couple of narcissists and understanding my pattern, like, oh, my God, like I'm picking guys that act like my dad. You know, when I think about the guy who like had all the goals and I thought was great and it turned out he was cheating and got somebody pregnant and blamed me. But, um, you know, I then really leaned in to the abandonment in that I told myself I am only going to open my heart. If I can be 100% sure 
that someone will not leave me. So that is what I prioritized over all other things. So, you know, in, um, and I still thought I was like, fine. You know, we go through life thinking we're fine. We're fine. I've got this. I'm fine. Nothing to see here. Move, moving along. Right. So I'm still like, dear God, I remember being like 26, 27 and being like, okay, God, I'm ready for you to send me my husband, you know, like being so earnest about it. And I'm like, God, please help me quickly identify anyone who is not my husband and send the right one. And then I would go on dates and sure enough, like within a couple of dates, he's not the one to the curb. He's not the one to the curb. Finally met, you know, my ultimately who became my husband. And what was so attractive to him was how much he, he like love bombed me, you know, from the very beginning. And he was coming, he had just gotten divorced six months prior and what I, what in listening to him talk about this relationship, he did everything in his power to stay married, you know, according to him, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he, he was devastated by his first marriage. In me. And so subconsciously, I now recognize that it was subconsciously, I was thinking, oh, he'll never leave. He did not want to leave this woman. Like, so he'll never leave. You know, that's what I was thinking. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that abandonment affects us. Like whatever it is that is our strongest trigger, we play it out. Mm -hmm. You know, even when we think that we're OK or I mean, honestly, I was very frank about my trigger. I'm like, look, I'm prioritizing not being abandoned. So mm -hmm. I don't want like I want to get married. I want to have kids and I want them to have a two parent home, you know, and I'm I am stable, Sally. You know, like, I'm like, we're going to, I'm a Capricorn. I'm as solid as they come. You know, I work, I'm going to buy a house. I don't cheat. I, you know, like I'm the ideal spouse. So I'm going to give you a great life. Okay. I'm just going to need you to do your part. You know, so that's kind of how, you know, I, I, I approach things like project management, which is actually something I'm trying to get away from. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like, okay, I need a husband because I got to have these kids. Let's manage this project. And he has, he has to be this type of husband, right? So I thought like, I'm checking my boxes and doing what I feel will create stability for me. You know, but really, you know, when we're thinking about relationships, what's most important, I now understand is emotional stability. So I think that's, that's another thing that we need to think about. Like, do we feel safe in someone's energy? Um, is the interaction between the two people something that feels safe, you know, am I able, like, do, am I getting, um, am I receiving positive energy from our interactions so that I'm feeling stable and secure? And then I can go out into the world and create abundance because I'm not worried about this stuff over here because it's beautiful. Even if there's an argument, right? It's still beautiful because we argue with each other in a safe way. I understand that like, you're not, you're not going to threaten, you know, in, you know, whatever it is, um, I'm not going to trigger you or you're not going to trigger me. Or if we do, we're going to talk about it, right? Like that kind of emotional stability. Um, so those are the types of things I wasn't necessarily thinking about. But again, you, you learn and you grow. And if you're able to, um, to surmount the hurdle with the person, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. You know, that's, what we would ultimately love to see. But if you're not, then you have to take those lessons and, you know, keep it popping, pushing, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's, for me, that's how abandonment showed up uh, mm -hmm. and, and impacted the choice that I made um, in a spouse and how I navigated the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I like what you're saying about like just managing adversity and just going through different things. Uh, I, I once heard a word of somebody said, I think it was a pastor or something. And he said, adversity is God's university. And I was like, that is mm -hmm. so true. And I realized a lot of times I grow through my adversity, even when my you know, my wife and I, we fall out. Yeah. I will learn more through that adversity. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. yeah. There's... 
I'm going to have to bring you back on the show because we have so much to discuss. <laughs> I would love that. This is fun. Yeah, right. We just kicking it. And I'm looking at the time. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's been like 47 minutes. But yeah, about 47 minutes. So l- let me let me get to this bonus round. I want to ask, ask you these questions. And uh, to the Brave Hearts community, to those who are watching it and listening, we got to bring Allison back. So in the comment section, letting me know we're going to bring Allison back. Tell it, tell say, Allison, I want you to come back. Say it in the comments below. <laughs> bonus round. What is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Not prioritizing their selves first. And they're when I when I say that I mean not I'm not talking about being selfish in within the relationship. What I'm saying is um, prioritizing your growth and who you want to be, how you want to show up for yourself first, because you can only show up, um, you know, in the most optimal way for your partner when you're showing up for yourself. So you know, doing that work you know, finding your empress energy, you know, not being, you know, understanding who you want to be in the world, Mm -hmm. first and foremost, and having your own. You know, I think a lot of times women, um, you know, a lot of women think that they need men. You know, we, we want to be in a position where we want men, you know, like we, we, of course, once we're married, we need each other, right? There's no like I, in we, but, you know, first and foremost, we want to work on ourselves. Yes. Yes. I agree. And, and just being that best version. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. So much. I want to ask you from seeing your parents relationship. What did it teach you about marriage? From my parents relationship? Yes. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, um, that's a uh, that's a difficult one just because my dad did leave when I was so young. So I'll answer it from my from the perspective of observing my mother. Is that okay? Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's not okay. the wrong answer. Yeah. Okay. I the from observing my parents' relationship, mm-hmm. the one the biggest thing that impacted me was seeing my mother's grace through it all. Uh through, you know, through the divorce and subsequent you know, my stepmoms and the deceitful things that my father did and seeing my mom handle it all with grace. You know, she never came, really came out of her, uh, out of character, if you will. And as, and you know, as a kid, you don't really recognize that. As an adult, you know, when my mom would say, you just don't know, you, you were like, five or six years old, and you would come home from your dad and your stepmom's house talking about how much fun you had. And I would listen and act so excited. And then after I got you to bed, I'd just go in my room and cry. <laughs> you know? so she always like, and she would all, she would say, cause I knew deep in my heart, kids can never have enough love, you know? So if you've got a great stepmom, great. You know, but still I was experiencing that pain because, you know, my dad remarried pretty quickly after my mom and she had to go go through that, Mm. you know, but we never saw it, you know. So just seeing understanding with adult eyes the way my mom handled that chapter. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting the way we see life as adults. And then once we get older and we're like. Oh, so that's what happened. And you're like, how did you handle that? Like, that was crazy. Ain't no way in the world I would have dealt with that, you know, or just, yes. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, because there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about, even just from the way I grew up. But that's another show for another time. Uh, last question. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Ooh. Well, okay. At, at the end of the day, the honest truth is you really can't love anyone else if you don't love yourself. You can fake it, mm-hmm. but you really can't. Mm-hmm. It's easier to show love to someone else than yourself because, you know, we don't we really don't want to look at ourselves, you know, honestly, mm-hmm. uh, until we do the work, you know, and, the, and begin to embrace ourselves. Like, oh my, I am I love me just as I am. And I mean, I'm 45 and just figuring this stuff out, you know? So we then love more authentically when we love ourselves. 
Mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. So what is what does that look like in Allison's personal life? Is it easier for you to love yourself or someone else? Now me. Yeah. I mean, showing up for me, loving me has become a priority, you know, because you know how they say, and I said this the other day in one of my social reels, um, put your own oxygen mask on before attempting to assist others. You know, you've got to love yourself first to show up for others and the more you do it the easier it gets mm. you know we're we are conditioned particularly as african-american women we are conditioned to put others above ourselves from you know our children to the men in our lives we are asked a lot of times to do that mm. so when we start to prioritize ourselves we can then love from a more deep and authentic place and show up for people in ways that are more um, that are more resident, right? Like engage more fully, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because we've taken the time to fill our own cups. And I want to kind of backtrack a little bit because you say so many interesting things that I just want to actually keep asking you questions. You said Black women are conditioned to mm -hmm. put others where does that conditioning come from? Is that a cultural or societal thing? Where, where does the conditioning come from? I think it, I think it's, I think it's cultural. I think it comes from the media, honestly. I mean, even when, if you think about it, I mean, I'm again, I'm 45. So I remember videos, you know, I remember, do you remember video jukebox? Of course. Yeah. We're a year okay. apart. I'm, I'm a year older than you. I'm 46. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so you remember like the video, I mean, from, from women shaking in videos, you know, like we're told our value is to shake for these men, you know, from, from pop culture and media in the rap lyrics, slap it up, flip it, rub yeah. it. I need to have something worth slapping and flipping and rubbing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the home, you know, girl, and I always tell my daughter, you don't have to give anybody a hug and a kiss. When we go visit family, you know, and she, cause she don't want to, she doesn't even know some of these great uncles. She hadn't seen them twice in her life. Come give me some sugar. Yeah. No, you don't have to do that. And I tell them too, she doesn't have to come give you sugar. That's not what she's here for. You know, if she feels comfortable enough to do it fine, but we're not going to push her. And I don't even have to like check my mother on this because mm -hmm. she, you know, my mom just like, she wants to show them how, you know, my mom's a Southern belle. So let me show them how well behaved Maya is. No, she doesn't need to do that. Or even when we hear something like, girl, you're not going to fix him a plate. If I want to fix my man a plate, fine, I'll fix him a plate. Otherwise, he knows where the plates are. And of course, like when we love someone, yeah, we want to make his plate. You know, I, if you want me to make you a meal at 2 a.m., OK, but don't you know, we're conditioned to do it. So just I think it comes from all all sectors, all of the places that we engage and all of the exposures that we have. So I think, again, another opportunity to break generational curses, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're, I, I think that's what we're here to do. We are here to say like, we are no longer doing this toxic stuff. We understand like no shade, no mm -hmm. shade to my mom's generation, of course. but they had to do a lot of conforming, you know, for survival. But now, you know, we can do things a little differently and we can say, like, even when like it comes to, you know, second chances in love and divorce and marriage, you know, I get it. You know, the 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 pastor at my ch at ex church may have some marriage counseling and may want me to stay married because if I get divorced, it's going to look bad in front of the, the 400 people that go to this church. But I'm sorry. Like, you know, like so we're here to say. We want our children to be healthier mentally. We want them to see, you know, emotionally healthier, mentally healthier. We want them to see, you know, mom's not, I, I want my daughter to see mom's not going to sit here and take, you know, whatever. Um, if, if it's a, if it's a chronic issue, right. If it's something that can't be, my dad isn't going to sit here and be unhappy and miserable, right? We can be amazing co-parents and still, you know, experience joy, mm -hmm. you know, because then we're teaching them how to experience joy. Yes. Right. So there's, there are trade-offs to everything. And I think, um, yeah, just in terms of like, like I said, breaking these curses and showing that like, there are a lot of, there's a lot of cultural pressure for us to do a lot of things, but that doesn't make it right. 
agree. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Last question. I'm, and I just thought of this as we talk because you have so many great points. Okay. I'm, I'm going to let you go. Old school love or new school love? Which one would you choose? I need context. You just said. You, need, okay. you, said, you said you need context? Yeah, define. What is your definition of each? I'm so well, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I was listening to what you were saying, and I mm -hmm. just thought about this, right? This is not in my notes. When you, when you talked about the, the things that your mom generation, you know, our, our parents' generation, the things that they had to go through, right? Like they had to stay together to economically, right? Mm. Uh, that's old school love. But a lot of times we put the old school love on a pedestal because they were together for 50 years. Mm. But if you look at today's dating scene uh, or relationships, there are they 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 there are some advantages, but the disadvantages too. You know, I mean, as far as uh just people being easily accessible, um, and we kind of live in more of like a selfish kind of culture. It's kind of more of just like oh. everything is about me, 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 me. You know, even like selfie, right? Who we never heard of selfie until like this culture, you know. So, I, and it's just a fun question. I was just thinking, you know, yeah. old school or new school love. Like, if you had to choose. Um, I, I, I can't, I couldn't choose because mm -hmm. there's so many, a combination of both, you know, like, I don't think, I mean, you can't, to me, mm -hmm. right? Like, we all want longevity in yeah. our marriages. I mean, there that's the goal, you know, things happen, right? And, you know, we are, we're all breaking, we're, we're overcoming generational trauma. Yes. And, you know, we we know like black, a lot of black mothers, for example, beat their sons who showed off. Right. Because they didn't want to see them dead. You know, they didn't want them to show off in front of white people and get killed. You know, so they had their does that make it, you know, it, it was a, it was a harmful practice that emasculated, you know, a lot of men. And created alcoholism, drug abuse, them skipping out on their on the families that they created, mm -hmm. you know. So in the 1950s and six or whatever have you, there's plenty of like historical um, fiction and history books, biographies. There's a really good one called The Man Not about the generational trauma of black men. That I have I, that book. I have an audio book. Are you serious? Oh my god! So yeah, I. I met a professor from Auburn University several years ago who told me about that book. But yeah, so we know, so we're overcoming so many things. And I was talking to a friend about this. Um, she's uh, a friend that lives up here in DC, but she's like, when I first started going through my separation, she's like, well, Allison, you know, we know our men are dealing with so much, right? So we have, we are, we deal with a lot in helping them, you know, cope with a lot of what they're dealing with, right? We know that, right? Especially if you have an educated Black woman who's read books like The Man Not, we know what we're getting into. We know what we're dealing with. We know how you're treated in a room full of white people. You know, we have Black sons. So we are like, okay, you coming at me with like an aggressive tone or whatever, I'm filtering that through the lens of what I think your experience is or what you told me your experience is or what, you know, culturally I know what your experience is. So that said, I don't even know what I'm talking about, Sean. <laughs> Old school and new school, right? We want, we want that tradition. I think I'm not going to speak for everybody. I, yeah. I want that tradition. You know, I want that person to show leadership you know, as the, the, the head of, of the family, you know, someone who respects and honors what I want to do and what we want to co-create as well. But African-American women, I mean, we're tired too, right? We're out here in these streets trying to support the family as well. So we want a, a lot of us, we want that leadership. You know, we want you to have a strong vision for our family. We want that vision to include our input. We want to see that you value what we bring to the table. We want to see that, yeah, we are on the same page when we with what we're co-creating. Uh, we don't, you know, we're not out here botting and bopping. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, trying to get to the next one. No, we're we're not doing that. We we want to show our kids what can be. So I think I think at the same time, let me add the new part in. At the same time, we also want to trans transcend tradition, right? We want to be able to recognize, okay, well, maybe this aspect of X wasn't the healthiest approach. We understand why you had to do that, but now we're able to do this, right? Now, that doesn't mean I'm discarding my spouse, you know, and I I think people need to slow down. Like, you need to be very cautious and careful. You can't have grasses greener on the other side syndrome. To your point about being selfish, you know, when we, we do see that in a lot of pop culture, and it, it's getting worse because of social media and celebrities who are just going through people left and right. I mean, they 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 get together to break up, and a lot of them get together just for the publicity. Yep. And they and and the kids who are looking up to them don't even understand that this agent talked to this agent to put together a, a okay, you all are going to be in the public eye together for nine months. We're going to contractually get you all to have nine pictures holding hands these kids don't understand that this is some of the stuff that happens because this celebrity might be gay but we don't want anybody to know he's gay so we're going to give him a beard this other so you know what i mean like all the kinds of things are going on behind the scenes and kids don't necessarily know that right so we have to have strong homes whatever that looks like right even if it doesn't work out with the biological mother or father we then like, you know, want to be focused on like if a traditional home is what you want and hopefully if you have kids, it is right. You're then looking at like a strong blended family, you know, mm-hmm. um, when you heal, not before. I want to clarify that. But yes, because we are seeing so much craziness on social media and the, the media cycle is no longer 24 hours because of social media. The media cycle is like every three hours. So our kids are getting bombarded with a lot. And if we're not talking to them, they don't know how to make heads or tails of it. Yeah, there's a, I read a stat about the average eight-year-old kid today has seen more images than like a 75, 80-year-old man, just that fast. Right. You know, average your average eight-year-old, he's seen more than, you know, so that's mind-blowing when you think about it. Yeah. Alone, when that kid turns 25, what will his thought process be? He won't even have his own thoughts. It'll be everybody else's thoughts, right? Right. Yeah. It's, if we're not explaining it to them, like, I think that's one of the things I've been really big on. Cause I, if you can't tell, I over communicate. Like, I don't like, I don't like not being like, I want it to be understood. You know, I don't, I don't want to, um, I want people to say, oh, no, I understand exactly what, you know, so I'm always talking to my kids, like, well, what did you think about this? You know, like, what was your thought when you saw that? And, and God bless my kids, you know, especially my boys, my daughter's nine, but my teenage boys, they see things clearly. Yeah. I mean, one day they were, they had to be like eight and seven. They were watching Dr. Phil because my mother had it, right? Of course she did. But um, they were watching Dr. Phil. My mom's cooking dinner in the kitchen. And my then seven-year-old goes, gotta love Dr. Phil. He gives a lot of not smart people, not good advice. And then the other son says, yep. And people watch it because it's dramatic. I swear, I saw this Facebook memory pop up the other day. And I, I was like, oh my gosh, like I talked to them so much about this stuff they see it for what it is. And I think we, ha- we as parents have to do the job of helping our kids uh, contextualize and process what they're seeing because we can't shield them from it. Right. Even if we're like, no, you can't watch that in the house. Somebody's gonna show it to them in school. You know, we can't shield them. So it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Unless you have kids, like I know a lot of people who just pull their kids out of school to homeschool them. Yeah, mm, that's popular by today's standards. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Allison, this has been a phenomenal episode. You got to come back because, like I say, there's a thousand and one questions I want to ask you. And I would love to. This is fun. Yeah, yeah for sure. Because it's easy to get lost in time. I had a guest come on one time. She was on the show for about two hours. Like it was just nonstop. It was so good that I just didn't want to lose the content because I'm like, this is a moment in time. Yeah, and that was, happened. Yeah, right. I was just like, oh my god. So anyway, 
Yeah, thanks again. Uh, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Give us all your information. Um, so that's a really good question. So I'm um, on um Instagram at it's Insta Alley. So it's, I post there mostly about spirituality and astrology because I'm into more esoteric pursuits, Christian based, but esoteric, you know, more metaphysical kinds of stuff. Yes. Um, and and spirituality and um. And yeah, I guess that's it. Oh, and I'm on Twitter at uh, underscore Allison Finch. Mm. Um, and that's mostly my handle for, I work in climate change, strategic communications. And as you pointed out, uh, for NBC News is Climate in Crisis, where I've been contributing as a freelance journalist uh, or working on like climate policy and climate innovation stories. This week though, I'm starting a new job. Um, I am going to work for U.S. Senate candidate Angela Also Brooks as director of communications. So I'm really thrilled about that. You know, she's got a solid record on climate change. Yeah. And it's important to, I, in my opinion, it's yeah. important that we get progressive candidates who are going to do right by climate policy into uh, the U.S. Senate. Yeah. So um, to the extent I'm very passionate about the environment. Um, I try to, as a communications professional, I feel my calling and my purpose is um, environmental uh, issues, whether it be environmental justice or raising awareness for the impacts of climate change on black and brown communities. So when I have an opportunity to do that, whether it's by doing journalism or doing communications for someone who we will get elected to Senate, that's what I'm, I feel called to do. So, yeah. So, yes, Instagram and Twitter. Yes. Yeah, because we met on Twitter, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you for Sean added me to the life after divorce group, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a group I never thought of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I had to, you know, I had to. <laughs> Just went with it though because that's where I am right now and I'm going with the flow right of the universe right now you know because when when life throws you lemons you know you got to make lemonade right? right so you're like okay that's where I am okay mm -hmm. so life after divorce it is and there are amazing people in that group I love seeing the threat I almost wish it was like a pride like because I was like okay well how does this work do I just hashtag something or what I wish we had like a WhatsApp or something where we could share content because um, mm -hmm. it's almost like you just have to tweet something and then everybody sees it. But it's also there, which kind of makes me feel vulnerable. But, you know, I just go with it. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's just that group, you know, that's all. So we all could be uh, relatable to one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the time that we got together. And like I say, I have to bring you back. Brave Arts community, you heard it here. Make sure you go follow Allison on those social media platforms. I'll have everything linked up in the description below. Thanks again to everyone who uh, left a rating and review on Apple Podcasts for the podcast. I, I love it. I love the comments. Keep them coming. Every so often, I'll read the comments. Uh, one of them, they just like really stand out. But continue to do that. If you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you leave a comment below. We'd we'll love to hear from you. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and share this with someone. And also make sure you like it. You know, a lot of y'all, y'all watch the videos, but then y'all like it. The time is there, but I'm like, so just hit the little thumb. That's all you got to do. Hit the thumb. So do that for me. So I would appreciate that. This is Sean Heineman with special guests. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciated it. No problem. Take care, people. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of It's Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarry, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video.